Welcome, Shrikant and Prashant. How are you today? All good. All fine. Thank you for having us. Great, great. So uh, let's let's start discussing MLOps, right? So, but before we uh, discuss on why the adoption of MLOps is low in India, uh, I just wanted to take a step back, right? So, do you think maybe we can discuss the use cases first? Is it at the use case level that uh, we need to address the issue before we kind of move on to MLOps? So yes, I think I think what's happening in the industry right now is we look at uh, you know a couple of years back versus now. I think. Until a couple of years back, we were uh, experimenting new technology. Let's look at okay, let's do a proof of concept. What is going to do with me? What's my what's my ROI going to be? Let me calculate. Because you know, AI is a uh, implementation. The CBA is the toughest part. How do you calculate the cost of the analysis? So now I think people are realizing the fact that okay, operationalizing a model is so important, so that they can start reusing the model and completely retrain the model and then see, see the benefits. But that is where the MLOps is coming into it. It's been there for some time, but just a, just picked up a step function uh, movement because of the benefits that people have started seeing. One more point I want to tell you is uh, when industries are looking at at, at that two angle, one is implementation uh, feasibility, how easy it is to implement with their existing technical stack versus value generation. And so you, you pick up use cases where you are going to get value, but at the same time you also have to look at whether you are, whether there will be an implementation, how feasible the implementation is. Okay, okay. Prashant? I think use case is a great place to start, right? And yeah. we, we looked at, I look at this from an engineering standpoint, you know, engineering use cases. So what do we have? For example, smart factory. Smart factory is a use case, industry 4.0. It basically you need underlying technologies for it. So underlying technologies, internet, uh, uh, industrial IoT, right? Yeah. Is an underlying technology. Cloud is an underlying technology. Surrogate models, digital twins. But what's the end application? Okay. So predictive analytics, predictive maintenance, prognostics of some kind. You know, digital transformation is probably an end use case. That's something that you're achieving at the end. If we can look at this from, so when you look at the use case, so who is doing smart factories today, okay? And how many organizations are actually being able to do that good workflow and get benefits from that, okay? okay. So they're probably at an initial stage, okay? okay. Uh, across across all industries. Mm -hmm. We can look at this also from MLOps from an automotive space, you know? Okay. Over the air, updates to your automotive, uh, your uh, the software that's running on your vehicle is an enabling technology. Okay. Things that you can get from that are probably automated driving, ADAS, uh, for EVs, uh, state of charge, EV charging are all applications. Now, these applications are still going to come with that. Okay. They're, they're building that, but they're not yet there. Power transmission, similar thing, you know, smart grids, uh, active grids, again, EV charging. All that infrastructure is, is still being put in place, and that's where MLOps in these kind of areas, like I say, from an engineering standpoint, is probably in pilot projects, it may be at a nascent stage, but it's sure to grow all the time. Okay. Correct. So, what, so while the selection of use cases is one part, uh, the other question that often gets gets asked is whether MLOps is worth the hype. And what I mean by here is that. MLOps has been uh, until now leveraged by mostly the big tech and that is mainly because of so many resources uh, needed are afforded affordable to only those uh, kind of companies. So can it be applicable in smaller AI ML companies, right? I think so. I mean, I think, I think, I think we, are, we are starting to see the change that people are doing. I mean, if you look at, you look at SageMaker as a platform, or Azure ML as a platform, GCP as a platform, Data IQ as a platform, data Roku as a platform. These are all end to end today for a data scientist to build an algorithm, one day deployment. But you know, yeah, because, because that's what they claim. But you know, you, you could do your entire CI, CD, CD pattern, you could use a single platform to do it. So, you also, so that change is happening. But at the same time, it's important, to, important that you, you need to understand where are we, where is the, where is the MLOps being used for an end, like for the person's point. You know, the application which is going to use this endpoint of MLOps is also important. Right? And do you really need a real-time forecasting today or a near real-time forecast? 
there is a cost to pay for a real time versus a near real time, right? Do you want to do that? So, so people have, people have to look at those cost factors, but is the cost cost factor negligible? Yes, if you look at the value, then MLOps can bring to an enterprise. Okay. Similar, you know, taking from there, we know from experience, from studies, half of all ML projects, at least, yeah, do not get implemented. Yeah. They don't get the deal. Yeah. Right? Because there's a pilot, but then that's it. That's a huge risk. Right? ML ops, like through standardization, through standard procedures, operation, can enable companies to actually get their, M, uh, their ML work, their AI work, Actually implemented, actually deployed. Okay, so so that's the that's the opportunity. Smaller companies may have it easier. They don't have a legacy that they need to that they need to carry with them. And cloud is a great level, right? So get, getting resources off the cloud is a great level for them. They don't have to invest upfront uh, on capital expenditure. They have an operational expenditure. Use the cloud, and and there you go. There you go. You have all the all so we have seen with this actually uh, some good uh, case studies with uh, startups, for example, in the wearables industry, where you know you have to deploy it now because your wearable does not have the compute power that's required for doing anything with this with basically in the AI space or anything. Yeah. So wearables uh, are, are are an industry where this is being taken up. And the logs are being used to deploy the algorithms onto the cloud where the where the processing is happening. Correct. Uh, uh, sports variables, you know, normal fitness variables. We've also seen an uptake in apps. Uh, so, for example, an, edu, uh, uh, an education app, yeah, uh, where they're actually using AI to um, to understand, you know, the right level of knowledge delivery that needs to happen to the student. Yeah. So, interactive knowledge. Is part of AI that is running on the cloud. Okay. So, so these are these are some use cases where smaller companies can take it up. They can implement it. We may not hear about it all the time. Yeah. But this is this is in the yeah. Just to just to add there, uh, MLOps has to be thought to from a strategic long term vision, not for like a short term vision. Right? Now, if a company wants to just create a forecasting model and just integrate an application into don't want to worry, okay, I'm happy with that. It's okay, hard code the model because that's hard code the model, or maybe use an EML file kind of methodology. And but no, if we, I mean, there's a lack of education also here. Right? How yeah. to educate the business leaders, or you know, and, and make, to make sure that you know, make them understand the benefits and the of that business language, not from the tech, tech language. Right? Okay, you know, your cost of building a forecasting model today is this much. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow, when you're Using that model and retraining the model, you don't start from zero. You may already have a model, you may want to just retweet the model and you know, put it there. So, if your cost actually going down drastically year on year or month by month when you're doing it, right? So, that education is the most important and and then the long term vision. That's fine. Correct. I think, I think so, which, which brings me to the next two questions, right? And so, one is talent and the other is cost, which is one of the things is while well, uh, many data scientists build machine learning model, they lack software engineering. So that is the issue. Like they're, they're not good at coding. Can traditional software engineers be hired to fill these gaps? If yes, uh, do they need any more training? Do they need anything? Uh, uh, do they need to upskill in different ways that they can enable them to be ready for this job? I mean, let me add to that. I'm sure Prashant will yeah. be able to answer much better. But I'll, I'll give you I believe data scientists, uh, for me, data scientist, when I say it, is an algorithm developer, right? I will leave him alone for his creativity. And for me, he's, he's, he's creating algorithm. Let him worry about how to get the math, mathematically best modeling. Let him not worry about how he's going to deploy all that because, because that pressure is going to create a different different pressure, right? And but at the same time, he needs to educate the thing that where his output is going to be used. So that the next guy who's going to pick up his model, model, but he's an ML engineer. Right? Okay. In the industry, we call it as ML engineer, ML engineer. Now, that guy, I think a software engineer with, a, with a, some kind of upscaling can be done, it can be created, that, that skill can be created. Because at the end of the day, it is documentation, Kubernetes, 
uh, you know, you know, how you know, how they're using airflow. You know, looking at looking at that. But but at the same time, the guy needs to know what what does that algorithm development do, right? I mean, what I mean, what? How did he arrive at, at that? Why is it that X plus C not done? At least at the base level, in, or the surface level, he needs to understand. So, so I mean, I'll keep it separate, and it's what time goes. And you know, taking from that point again, it's a, the algorithm developer can be building the ML algorithm itself. They keep that as one layer, the one part. For the way it, um, when we're looking at this, especially uh, taking it from an engineering standpoint, again, we look at enabling domain experts to be able to use AI, ML, VL techniques in their day to day work. They approach a, a, a problem typically from first principle. You you understand the physics of the of the of the device of the problem, you solve that. But then with additional more and more complexity in systems, the decision making is not just physics uh, based. You have to it, it is data driven. So how do engineers pick up those kind of uh, techniques? So we enable on that. At least from this perspective, then you, uh, you know your computer scientist, computer software engineer is actually looking at. Operationalizing, enabling automation, and, 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 and ensuring that that whole workflow is, uh, is functioning. Right? I mean, philosophically, one could also look at this like, let's say, software engineering looks for deterministic answers. Yes. And data scientists look for probabilistic answers. Look for probabilistic answers, which, you know, it's a totally different philosophy. So <laughs> that's why I mean, I mean, I want to mix them. Yeah, so I th th the point is that they should be different, like data scientists and this. They should be different, but they should work together. They, they should work, they should be able to sing together. It's the same person, but the hat has to be different. You're being very, very different thinking hat at that point in time. Okay. okay. Because ML engineer has to think of an end user application guy that hacks it. How is he going to use it? Yeah. How, 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 you know, uh, and how do I, how do I make sure that it is it is automatically uh, CI, CD, CD pipelines are created, all that, all that. And to his point, Data scientists should have the most domain and then the ML engineer. ML engineer, when I said domain, industry domain. Correct. Okay. Industry yeah, domain. Yeah. But the ML engineer need to understand the entire system. From okay. data flow from ingestion to consumption. That's all you yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and that brings me to my next question. So talent cost is one of the major costs. And but at the same time we were dis before the question before this we were talking, if they implement MLOps, they are going to save money in the longer run. In the shorter run, is it good to cost money? Not just in terms of talent, where you kind of have to invest uh, nurturing them or hiring them uh, inorganically, or and even beyond that, in terms of let's say infrastructure or the resources that are needed to kind of implement these frameworks or successful deployments. So, how does cost come into this play? I mean, again, add more here. Of the engineering experience, but I'll tell you that's why I said long term vision, right? You need to have that your three year plan or five year plan, they have an enterprise analytics, AI. How do you want to drive enterprise and advanced analytics or AI or in your org and create that three year plan? Now, hiring data scientists is one thing, but you need to give them tools and infrastructure, right? You need to give them if you ask, if you want to have a computer vision problem, you better give them GPUs. You end up on, you uh, you want to have an optimization problem, you give them a better computer. The computing problem. So it goes in hand in hand with infrastructure and all that. But it's just that you know you want to have the long term vision of three years. You know, why do you three years vision? And then you add use cases on top of it because you're setting up a look at look at I mean draw a parallel you 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 uh, building a uh, multi-story building. Your your foundation has to be strong, then you're building first floor, then you're building second floor, third floor. So you you look at that way, but this foundation has to be strong. The way the foundation is that having the right mix of people and infrastructure and the vision. Okay, I, I think that's a that's a wonderful way of looking at it, right? And the thing is, I mean, I have a, actually an anecdote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so uh, where MLOps does not have to be expensive, but you have to think about how to implement what you need to do. The example I have is. These uh, transformers you have in residential areas. Okay. You know, your old mounted transformers. Yeah. Millions of them across India. Um, one of our customers has actually worked on 
figuring out what happens with these transformers, especially you know the case that when the when the oil level in these transformers is reduced, they tend to catch fire. Yeah. And so that you know leads to blackouts, etc. and maintenance costs. So what they did is that they built a digital twin of the transformer. Mm -hmm. But rather than building millions of digital twins for millions of transformers, create one reference digital twin, a normalized one. Yeah. But feed that with information that is coming from sensors from the field. Okay. So they retrofitted the transformers on the field with two sensors and a transmitter. That is sending data off to the digital twin, to the reference normalized digital twin which is then giving uh, predictions on whether the transformer is going to fail. Mm -hmm. This implementation is at one fifth the cost of a full fledged digital twin. Mm -hmm. So, thinking of it from that perspective, again, the domain knowledge, the understanding of the domain, the understanding of which data to take, how to use it, what model to use, that all plays a difference, and that will give you the edge. Mm -hmm. And that is where you're, you're, you'll see a cost benefit uh, return. Correct, right. correct. And so, so I think what the, the gist of what you're trying to say is there needs to be a kind of a plan because in the longer run you are going to save money in this thing. That brings me to why there is still hesitation. Is it and is one of the reasons because there is a lack of successful use cases, uh, not just in India but beyond on uh, the implementation of MLOps for successful deployment. And if there is, how do we overcome this? I think two things. One is. Uh, correct. Like you correctly said, the selecting the right use cases is very important. Mm -hmm. Second, I think, is change management. I think there has to be, you have to drive a change management culture. You are you're suddenly moving from a SaaS space to now, you know, somebody developing an R, uh, you know, R model and putting in Excel, putting in a PowerPoint presentation and presenting it. Now, suddenly, he's seeing a different way of working. Right? I mean, he needs to store the model in the rest of the so that change management has to be driven by at the development side. Then the consumer side, when I say consumer side, the consumer of the energy basically inside of their enterprise, right? Because they need to understand how the, how their data is actually now you know collected, collected, harnessed, and then developed into that, that insight. Because you know, they need to understand how to read that model also. Well, that model also I mean, what is it giving me? Say so, my forecast is saying. Okay, I'm going to have 100 cases, you know, 100,000 cases we ship to ship to a uh, say we have a whatever today. But on what confidence is there? What does it mean? So I need to educate the consumer also. What does it mean? So that change management also has to be has to be there as well. That's right. Okay. Okay. Prashant. So you know, change management. We have also case studies. Uh, for example, the, you know, like let's say technology industry. Going back to the smart factory. Right. Mm -hmm. How how does an MSME uh, get enough yeah. confidence yeah, yeah, yeah. to be able to invest in thinking about uh, hiring ML people, hiring ML engineers, hiring data scientists to then actually get an ROI of implementing let's say smart factory? Okay. So a technology demonstrator is one thing that we're working on. So basically, uh, we're working with, uh, for example. Uh, Foundation for Smart Manufacturing mm -hmm. at uh, IIT. So we're working with them to create a technology demonstrator so that we can then show to people and do MSME so that they can see the technology in action and understand what it does and what value they get from it. So especially for adoption, at least at a smaller scale, you know, we have to invest to be able to get people to understand it. And then take them forward. Okay. Okay. So, so from what I gather, I think the the uh, the adoption uh, needs for the adoption to be better. I think there needs to be and the change management has to happen from both sides. The one who's providing the services as well as the one who's receiving. So something as the example that you gave, like a traditional industry like MSME, right? They probably can't see the value of a technology. Like we have always seen predominantly. Uh, traditional companies to be hesitant to adopt newer technologies. So then, the final uh, the final question is, what can we do about it, right? So, in terms of both the uh, the provider as well as the uh, the one who's receiving the services, what are the different what are the different initiatives 
uh, that at an industry level or at a policy level that can be taken uh, so that all the stakeholders, right, the corporates, how, what are the different initiatives that need to be taken so that this changes? Um, yeah, so uh, identifying skills, identifying the right skills for example is one thing that we all need to understand and agree upon and then also enable uh, all the players in this, let's say, industry, academia, uh, uh, their corporates, government as, uh, as well, to come together on and understand and take forward. So basically when we're talking about enabling domain, experts to be able to also understand uh, AI techniques or use them. So working within, I take all from the engineering space, right? So the, going from the engineering space, understanding, okay, how, in which courses do we need to integrate AI? Right? Okay. How do we, how to integrate it in the best possible way? With what parts of the problem statement relate to, this, uh, to the solution? And how do we and, and take the forward on that, on that front? So basically, getting an educated on the one side. Okay. And on the other side then, if, you know, the, the rest of the ecosystem has to come together. Um, working with accelerators, startups, seeing them also adopt, or helping them nurture that ecosystem. Is they, uh, I said earlier, right, they don't have a, they don't have a, uh, a legacy. Okay. So they can adopt actually much faster. So they, just giving them the right tools and the right direction gives them a good opportunity to take things forward. Okay. So those are some things, I mean, it, it basically comes down to coming together, thinking about it, investing thought as well as time and money to enable others as well. Okay. I think that's... I mean, just to add to that, I mean, consistent change management, consistent education. I mean, I mean are making people aware what is what is a benefit. Because it's not a one-time but I mean, it, it has to be consistent. It's, yeah. hard, it's hard, but not impossible. Not, I mean, it is possible. Right? Yeah, it is possible. Yeah. But I think someone, someone needs to be patient, uh, persistent, and continue to push. But there is benefit. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Srikant and Prashant, uh, for these answers. Uh, this will definitely help. Uh, I think this reaches out to a far audience, which includes data scientists and uh, overall leaders who are related or associated with this industry. Uh, do you have any closing remarks in terms of the overall adoption of MLOps? In, in not just in India, but beyond as well. I mean, it's almost I think I hope. I mean, we are seeing the change. I think industry is seeing the change. I hope the change is totally near. It keeps going up, upwards, not as a, you know, as a, you know, still, a, you know, in stagnation, stagnation. I think more enterprises when they start getting the benefits out of it, I think you will I mean, you will see more and more companies joining the that but I think it's a, it's a journey. Yeah. Uh, there's no end to it. Okay. Rasha? Yeah, it's very exciting. I agree. It's an absolute it's a journey. We're on this. Um, it, we have to see what the what what applications can actually benefit from it, where it can be used and uh, you know what new technology and what new products we can create. From using such technologies. Right, so that's all. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.